What's up, Ozone? So welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to Haps. <laughs> welcome. Uh, this is going to be a audiobook read through kind of thing. Uh, I have read these stories before, um, but today we're going to get started with Help Wanted. I'm super excited because this is my favourite story of all time. I mean, I've never read it, but uh, I know the leaks, so. This is such a good story. You're going to have such a great time with this entire book, really. It is a blast. So, I think we should get straight into it. Why is the men's room always such a nightmare? Steve sprayed the toilet and walls with disinfectant. It was weird. The women's room never needed anything but a basic mop, wipe down, and replenishing of soap and toilet paper. But when taking care of the men's room, he always felt like he might as well be cleaning the monkey house at the zoo. Steve never thought he'd be scrubbing toilets at gas station for minimum wage. With his digital art and design skills, he always figured he'd be working for one of the many tech companies in his booming city, preferably designing video games. He had a billion ideas, many of them better than games that were already on the market, if he did say so himself. Yet here he was, with a toilet brush in one hand, and a bottle of spray cleaner in the other. For the past several years, he had applied for any position at a tech company that he was remotely qualified for, but the competition was fierce. He was up against all these kids with expensive Ivy League degrees, who had already done internships or had jobs at the most prestigious companies in the country. Steve had graduated from a local public college, paying for his tuition by working long hours at crappy jobs, and once he earned his degree, he was never hired for anything but more crappy jobs. He made his way to the second stool in the men's room. In this case, the term crappy job was literal. Steve's tiny studio apartment was one floor above a takeout place named Capernerni's Fish Boat. The greasy odour wafted upward so that the carpet, furniture and bedding in the apartment always smelled of fried fish. Even Steve's clothes hanging in the closet had absorbed the smell. Sometimes stray cats followed him on the street, breathing in his fishy aroma. As soon as Steve got home from work, a shower was absolutely essential. Sometimes he felt like he should spray himself with the disinfectant he used to clean the gas station restrooms. By the time he showered and changed into clean, comfortable, if slightly fishy smelling clothes, he was ready to eat something and get to his real work. He popped a frozen burrito in the microwave, grabbed a soda from the fridge, and sat down at the computer. The project he was working on, Chip Off the Old Block, was a family-friendly fetch and quest-based game featuring cartoony chipmunks. He was about halfway through the design and he hoped that a company would be interested in it, but if they weren't, maybe he'd try to just bring it out himself. He was tired of cleaning toilets and waiting for something to happen, which reminded him he should message Amanda before it was past her bedtime. Recently, Steve's tiredness of waiting for something to happen had led him to join a dating app. He had always dreamed of marrying a smart, kind, beautiful woman. They would live in a comfortable house and have two adorable kids, a boy and a girl. But dreams were one thing, reality was another. Strangely, one didn't meet many attractive women cleaning toilets and mopping floors at a gas station convenience store. Occasionally, an interesting woman would come into the store to pay for gas or grab a gallon of milk, but it was hard to be suave, eh? or suave with a mop in your hand. For a while, he didn't think he was going to meet anyone through the app, either, but then he had seen Amanda's profile and sent her a cautious message that only said hi. She said hi back, almost immediately. After that, they progressed to an actual conversation. Well, as close to an actual conversation as texting could be. Steve had been drawn to Amanda's profile pic not just because she was traditionally beautiful, but because she seemed to radiate kindness. She had shoulder-length brown hair and a winning smile. She was a preschool teacher, and Steve figured she was a good one because of her kindness, patience and sense of humour. The weird thing about their relationship was that even though they had been chatting for over a month, they had gotten out on only two real dates. Steve worked at the gas station from 3pm until 10pm, and Amanda worked at the preschool from 7am until 3.30pm. They couldn't have found more incompatible schedules if they had tried. Steve grabbed his phone and texted her, I hope you had a good day. 
She texted back, A kid threw up on my shoes first thing this morning, but at least that my day had to get better from there. Lol. Steve chuckled. He guessed they both had to deal with more than their fair share of grossness at their jobs. He typed, Lol. If things went down here from here, it would be pretty bad. I'll let you get some rest. Good night. She texted, Night night, with a sleepy face emoji. Steve smiled, set aside his phone, and settled back into work on his game until he was too tired to stay awake anymore. As soon as Steve opened the door of the convenience store, his manager, a humorous, middle-aged man with the unfortunate name of Gilbert Hurlbut, <laughs> looked up from his phone and said, Some kid spilled about a gallon of blue slushy over by the back left cooler. Go mop it up. No problem, Steve said. Which was what he always said to Mr. Hurlbut. It was the path of least resistance. He went to the janitorial closet and set the mop bucket under the faucet in the utility sink. Would it have killed Mr. Hurlbut to say hello before he started baking, uh, barking orders? Steve poured some cleaning solution into the filing, into the filling bucket, sorry, and thought, not for the first time, about the bizarreness of Mr. Hurlbut's name. Mr. Hurlbut's parents, presumably Mr. Hurlbut Sr. and Mr. Hurlbut, or Mrs. Hurlbut, knew that they were having a child who would be saddled with their ridiculous last name. So why not give the kid a normal name, like Matthew or David or something, instead of saddling with him with an equally unwieldy first name? Of course, that being said, Mr. Hurlbut could choose to go by Gil or Bert, but instead the name Gilbert was stretched right over the breast pocket of his uniform shirt. Steve's wandering thoughts resulted in the mop bucket overflowing. He tilted it and poured some out of the excess water, and then carried the bucket and mop to the back of the store to clean up the sticky mess. Steve's hands were mopping, but his mind was on the on his game and what he would work on as soon as he got home from this meaningless job. I said, can you spare me a moment? Steve hadn't, had been so preoccupied he hadn't even noticed that a man was standing right next to him trying to get his attention. The man in question did not resemble the customers they usually got in the store, exhausted, inexpensively dressed people coming from or going to night shift jobs. Even though Steve didn't know much about clothes, he could tell this man's dark suit was expensive. It was spotless and wrinkle-free, and seemed to have been tailored to the contours of his body. I'm sorry, can I help you? Steve said. I think perhaps you can, the man said. He had a strong, uh, he had strong chiselled features, and a haircut that looked as expensive as his suit. That is, if you're Steve Snodgrass. I am, Steve said pointing to his name tag and immediately feeling like an idiot. Could you step outside with me for a moment? The man said. This situation was getting stranger and stranger. Steve had thought the man just needed help locating an item in the store, but now it appeared that this guy wanted something from him personally. Steve felt nervous. Was the guy a cop? A serial killer? I don't know about that, sir, Steve said. I just started my shift, so I'm not due for a break yet. I don't want to get in trouble with my boss. Well, if you step outside of me, you may find yourself working for another boss. And for a great deal more money. He smiled. His teeth were perfect. Steve was growing more confused by the moment. Was this man in the mafia? I'm afraid I don't understand. Perhaps this will help. The man said, handing Steve a business card. Steve looked down at the card and read, Brock Edwards, Talent Acquisition... Fazbear Entertainment. It took a few seconds for the name Fazbear to ring a bell, but then Steve remembered the kids' pizza places that had once been widely popular, but had suffered a downfall after a, vari after a variety of criminal allegations. There had been a talk of murders, though Steve didn't remember how many. There was weirder stuff too, stories about paranormal events and that kind of nonsense. Fazbear frights. <laughs> Uh, Steve was still puzzled, but he had to admit he was curious too. Maybe I could step outside for just one minute, he said. Very good, Mr. Snodgrass, Mr. Edwards said, following Steve out the back door. They stood out back near the dumpster. The fumes of garbage hung in the air. You are familiar with Fazbear Entertainment, Mr. Edwards said. Kind of, Steve said. I mean, I went to the pizza place a couple of times as a kid, birthday parties and that kind of thing. And also, I know a little about the 
scandals. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of people know about Fazbear Entertainment, Mr. Edwards said. Over the past few years, there have been a number of individuals determined to smear our company's reputation by spreading terrible rumours. And of course, the public dines on that kind of filth. He straightened his already straight tie. And so, as a result, Fazbear Entertainment is in need of some rebranding. Okay, but I still don't know what this has to do with me. Mr. Edwards looked Steve up and down. You are a game designer, are you not? An aspiring one, I guess you could say. How did this guy know he made games? You sell yourself short, Mr. Snodgrass. <laughs> You've posted two games online and they were quite good. Thanks, Steve said. Though he still wasn't sure how this guy had found out about his games. He wondered what else Brock Edwards knew about him. And so here's where you come in, Mr. Edwards said. In an effort to laugh of... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. In an effort to laugh off our detractors, Fuzzbur Entertainment wants to put out a line of video games based on the lies that have been spread about the company. Horror games. You mean like horror games based on what people say happened in the old pizza places? Steve said. The idea seemed distasteful at best, cruel at worst. Yes, Mr. Edwards said. They should be scary, but at the same time, they should poke fun at the ridiculousness of all those libious rumours and accusations. He put on a smile that looked calculated. We'd like you to develop a series of four games for us, Mr. Snodgrass. I think you'd find the compensation much more generous than what you're currently being paid for. Uh, mopping. A job offering game development. It was what Steve had dreamed of his entire life. So why did it feel so weird and wrong? We'd want you to start right away, of course. We could fly you to a remote location where you'd have everything you'd need to work on the game. Plus everything you'd need to live comfortably. A spacious condone, con condominium, sorry. A personal chef, staff to run your errands and do your laundry, a home gym if you let us if you choose to use it. He looked disdainfully at Steve's gym free physique. We could give you until Friday to tie up any loose ends. It's an incredible opportunity, Mr. Snodgrass. What do you say? Horror games, huh? Steve said, stalling. If they were horror games based on ghosts and goblins or other purely fictional creatures, he wouldn't have a problem with them. But horror games based on what he had understood to be real murders made him feel queasy. Fazbear Entertainment said the murders weren't real, but they would say that, wouldn't they? That's right, Mr. Edwards said. They'd need to be based in the Fazbear Entertainment universe, but you'd have a lot of creative freedom within those bounds. But I couldn't work on them here. There was something troubling about this whole situation that he couldn't quite put his finger on. No, the company was very specific about that. They don't want any chance of leaks. Leaving town for a long period of time was another sticking point. It was hard enough to see Amanda given their differing work schedules. They hadn't gotten close enough yet to make a long distance relationship work. He was starting to think he really liked her. If he took a chance with Fazbear Entertainment, a company with a dicey reputation at best, was it worth the risk of losing his chance with Amanda? I truly appreciate the offer, Mr. Edwards, but I just don't feel right about taking this job. The world's a scary enough place without adding more horror to it. I really want to concentrate on making family-friendly games. He had made, he had his personal reasons for saying no as well, but this was probably the biggest one. Didn't kids already have enough to be scared of in today's world? Mr. Edwards laughed for a longer time than was comfortable. Do you mean to tell me that you're going to walk away from this opportunity? Go back inside that store and pick up that mop? Yes, I do, Steve said, but thank you for your offer. He wasn't looking forward to going back inside, getting yelled at by Mr. Hurlbutt, and cleaning floors and the toilets. But somehow he still felt strangely good about his decision. Oh my gosh, that is such an amazing introductory section. I absolutely love the beginning to this story. Um, Steve's the rogue indie developer, right? He, or he was like set up to be at least. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Let me just have a sip of water. That's something I'm going to be doing more um, 
throughout these audiobooks is having more water because I my throat dries up very quickly these days. Uh, anyway, still in his pyjamas, Steve padded barefoot in the kitchen to start a pot of coffee. A little something to eat and some major caffeine and he'd be ready to settle in and work on chip off the old block for a few hours until it was time to head to the gas up. He popped some bread into the toaster and grabbed a couple eggs from the fridge. His phone pinged. Thinking it might be Amanda, he picked it up. Someone had messaged him on the dating app. Strange. It definitely wasn't Amanda because she would have just sent him a regular text. Curiosity got the better of him. He opened the app and saw... A message from Victoria. Who the heck was Victoria? He opened the message and read, Hi, would you like to chat sometime? <laughs> I don't know why that was the don't know why that was the voice I gave her. I was trying to do a female voice, but it it didn't go very well. He clicked on her picture to enlarge it. When he saw it he gasped. If someone had asked him to describe what his physical ideal of a woman would be, his description would exactly match the photo he was looking at. Victoria had long, wavy black hair with a beautiful sheen that caught the light. She had big, doe-like brown eyes and a sun-kissed complexion. Her cheekbones were high and her lips were full. She wore just enough makeup to accentuate her natural beauty. And of course, he reminded himself, people were notoriously dishonest on the internet. This could be a random photo that someone much less physically attractive had found to pass off as their own, or it could be a photo of the actual woman from 20 years ago. But if it wasn't, what if this vision of loveliness was real, and had decided for whatever reason that she was interested in him? Wait, he told himself, what about Amanda? Amanda was a nice, caring person, and there seemed to be a real connection between them, but then again, they were in such an early stage of their relationship that he wasn't even sure it could be called a relationship yet. And they hadn't said they were exclusive. <laughs> oh my gosh. Amanda could be dating half a, dozen du half a dozen guys for all he knew. He hit reply to Victoria's message and typed one word. Sure. As soon as he tapped send, Steve smelled something burning. It was like for a few minutes there he had entirely lost track of where he was and what he was doing. Home, kitchen, breakfast, he reminded himself. He looked at the counter and saw black smoke rolling from the toaster. After he threw, threw away the burnt toast, opened a window to let the smoke out and poured himself a cup of coffee, Steve sat down at the computer to work on the game. The mysterious message from Victoria, whoever she might be, had left him too keyed up to feel like eating anything. His phone pinged again. Hi, it's me. I'm glad you said you'd like to chat. Is now a good time? Sure, Steve typed. Any time's a good time. As soon as the world, uh, sorry, as soon as the words appeared on the screen, Steve did a face palm. So much for not sounding too eager. I've never used a dating app before. I'm really more of a face-to-face -face person. Maybe you would like to meet sometime soon. Maybe this weekend. Sure. You could come to my house if you want. It's out in the country. It's really quiet. We'd have plenty of privacy to talk and to get to know each other. Are you sure you want me to come to your house for our first meeting? Shouldn't we meet in a public place first in case I'm a creep or something? Haha, <laughs> lol, I trust you. How about Saturday at noon? I'll make us lunch. Sounds great. As soon as they finished chatting, Steve remembered he had plans with Amanda for Saturday. She was an understanding person, though. She'd be okay with rescheduling. He texted her. So sorry, but something came up. Can't do Saturday. Almost immediately, she texted back. Disappointed, but okay, with a sad emoji. Steve felt guilty, but he told himself he'd make it up to her. Matt, still dressed in the uniform of the computer store he managed, dunked a donut in his coffee. In the flesh! No! <laughs> But I thought things were going good with Amanda, he said. They are. Steve had called Matt, asking if, they could, if he could meet him at the all-night donut shop after work. His life was getting way too eventful all of a sudden, and Matt, his best friend since freshman year of college, was the only person he felt like he could talk to about it. Matt was unfailingly honest and had never hesitated to tell Steve when he was making a horrible mistake. Matt also seemed to have the infuriating habit of always being right. But this message, Steve said, it came out of nowhere. And this woman, 
Suddenly, he was at a loss for words. This woman said she'd send goons to beat the crap out of you if you didn't go out with her? Steve laughed. <laughs> no. This woman said if you didn't go out with her, she'd make all your darkest secrets a matter of public record? No, Steve said, still laughing. But to be fair, my life to date has been too boring to accumulate many dark secrets. He took a deep breath and tried to find the words to, to explain himself. This woman, he picked up his phone. Here, let me show you. He picked up the dating app, found Victoria's picture and showed it to Matt. Matt's jaw dropped and so did his donut. Whoa, he said. I get it. I totally get it. Steve handed him another donut. He was relieved that Matt understood. Even though he was beginning to doubt his GPS, Steve turned off a narrow, winding country road onto another narrow, winding country road. It was beautiful out here with rolling hills and trees and the occasional pasture full of cows, but Steve couldn't imagine living somewhere so remote. He also couldn't imagine that a woman as beautiful and glamorous as Victoria would want to live in such a rural area. Surely someone so lovely and charming would want to live where she, sh where she could see and be seen. Turn left on Brushy Pine Road, the GPS ordered. Your destination will be on your left. The destination seemed to be a long gravel driveway that led into a densely wooded area. Steve drove doubtfully, but the GPS had never steered him wrong before. Finally, the driveway ended at a house. It was small and modest, a neat little white cottage with green shutters and a green front door. It looked more like a home for someone's grandmother than for an attractive young single woman. He parked, grabbed the bouquet of grocery store flowers he had selected for her and walked up to knock on the door. No one answered, Steve sighed. Had this been some kind of trick? He tried the door and was surprised to find it unlocked. Hello? Anybody home? He called. When there was no response, he stepped inside. He wouldn't normally have entered someone's house without permission, but he reasoned that he had been invited and that was good enough. Steve was surprised to find himself standing in an empty room. The white walls were blank, the windows were curtainless, and there was not a single piece of furniture in sight. He wondered if he had made some kind of mistake. Was she meeting him as a real estate agent trying to sell him a house instead of as a date? The house may have been empty, but it was not silent. There was a soft but steady mechanical whirring sound. And then, so suddenly that it made Steve jump, a loud, high-pitched ringing that hurt his ears, his brain. What was going on in this bizarre place? He felt suddenly unsteady on his feet and propped himself up against the wall to regain his balance. Steve! The horrible ringing stopped and was replaced by a voice like velvet. Oh, sorry, I can't do a voice like velvet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I'm so sorry, I must not have heard the door. Her looks did not disappoint. She was just like the picture online, except better, because she was standing there right in front of him. She was wearing a form-fitting green dress, which complemented the flecks of green in her brown eyes. Her figure was fit and toned, as if she worked out regularly, but was also curvy in the right places. Curvy in the smile, ha <laughs> ha, ching. <laughs> Steve was instantly besotted. Hi, he said, wishing he had planned some kind of clever opening line. Since he hadn't, he shoved the bouquet at her instead. She received the flowers and smiled, all lovely lips and straight white teeth. How beautiful, and thoughtful too. Thank you. She looked around the room, as if trying to imagine it from his point of view. I know I haven't done much with the place yet, but with the right touches, I think it'll be really cosy. And for our lunch, I thought we could have a sort of a picnic on the floor. We can put down a blanket... And I have bread and cheese and fruit and some good chocolate. That sounds nice. Before Steve could say anything else, there was another horrible, high-pitched electronic scream. He looked up in the direction of the sound and saw the red light flashing on the smoke alarm. Beep, beep, beep! It was strange. He could neither see nor smell smoke. He reached up to try to disable it, but lost his footing as the room began to spin faster and faster like an out-of-control merry-go-round. Steve opened his eyes. He was lying on a couch. But where? The layout of the small room was familiar. 
but when he had seen it before, it had been empty. Now there was the chocolate brown couch he was lying on, and a matching armchair. There was a coffee table stacked with both fashion magazines and tech-themed magazines, and a large cabinet with a flat-screen TV and a few different kinds of video game consoles. The walls, that had been blank before, were now hung with photos of Victoria. Victoria, hiking in the mountains, her lustrous hair windblown and beautiful. Victoria, tanned and toned, and gorgeous in an emerald green two-piece swimsuit, lounging on the beach. Victoria, eating an ice cream cone on a park bench, looking adorable with a dab of ice cream on her perfect nose. Victoria herself came padding barefoot into the room, wearing jeans and a black fitted t-shirt. Hadn't she be hadn't eh, hadn't she been wearing a dress earlier? Then again, the room had been empty earlier too. Steve was hopelessly confused and disoriented. Hey babe, Victoria said. You had a bad dizzy spell and kind of passed out on the couch. I bought you a glass of water. Why don't you try to sit up and drink a little? Steve had never had a dizzy spell before, but now that he thought about it, he had been too nervous about the date to eat breakfast this morning. He sat up slowly. You know, I think I'm. I think maybe I need to eat something. He accepted the water glass and was surprised to find himself drinking it down in a few gulps. Were we going to have a picnic on the floor? Now Victoria looked confused. A picnic on the floor? You mean like on our first date? Our first date? But isn't this? Steve looked around the furnished room. I'm sorry. I am really confused. Victoria sat down next to him and took his hand. Confused or not, Steve loved having her close to him, touching him. It happens, honey. It happens," she said, squeezing his hand. "Sometimes you forget things. You have memory loss." As a result of that car accident you had a few years ago, I don't remember a car accident," Steve said. He was a very careful driver. Exactly, Victoria squeezed his knee. You took a bad hit on the head, brain injury. Most of the time you're fine, but sometimes your memory just wipes temporarily, and then it's like you reset, and you're all good again. This was upsetting news. He wondered how many times Victoria had to tell it to him. But I always reset, so I remember things again. Victoria smiled. Always. Steve nodded. The explanation was weird, but it also made sense. His sense of time was off. That explained everything. So you and I, we're together. Victoria laughed. We are very, very together. Wait. She got up from the couch, grabbed one of the framed pictures off the wall, and handed it to him. The photo was taken outdoors under an arch of flowers. Victoria stood smiling in a lacy white gown and veil, holding a bouquet of flowers that matched the ones decorating the arch. Steve was standing beside her in a tux, but the main thing he was wearing was an impossibly big smile. No wonder, Steve thought. His wedding day had to have been the happiest day of his life. Too bad he had no memory of it whatsoever. You are so beautiful, he said. It was a beautiful dress," Victoria said. "Not just in the picture," Steve said. "Always, you're always so beautiful." "Ah, you're too sweet to me," Victoria said. She leaned forward and pressed her lips to his. It was wonderful. It felt like their first kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a very weird reaction. That's just a funny line to me. The first kiss, because technically it's the first kiss we see, and we don't know if it is their first kiss or not. But we'll see. Daddy, wake up! It's time for pancakes. Steve opened his eyes. Two children were standing beside the bed. They were wearing pajamas with some kind of cartoon characters on them and jumping up and down and yelling, "Pancakes! Pancakes!" The girl looked to be around four, and the boy around two. Both of them had thick black hair and big brown, green fleckled eyes. Fleckled, flecked eyes. They were beautiful children. The girl and boy he had always wanted, but he had no memory of pregnancies, of births, of infancies or childhoods before this moment. He didn't even know the kids' names. Were they his? Pancakes, huh? He said, sitting himself up in the bed and trying to vein and orient himself. 
The walls, he noticed, were covered with photos of the children from babyhood until now. Steve was even in some of the pictures with them. Today is Saturday, and on Saturday, Mummy always... Sorry, this is not Steve, this is the little girl. Today is Saturday, and on Saturday, Mummy always makes pancakes, the little girl said like she was lecturing him. Okay, sounds good, Steve said, standing up. Lead the way. The little girl took one of his hands, and the little boy took the other. It was a sweet, unfamiliar feeling, those tiny hands gripping his. Victoria was in the kitchen, looking beautiful even in her pink bathrobe with no makeup and her hair unstyled. She was standing over a skillet, expertly p flipping pancakes. All hail the pancake queen, Steve said, kissing her on the cheek. Pancake wench is more like it, she said, laughing. I always forget what a long process this is until I'm actually doing it. Well, we appreciate it, don't we, kids? Steve said. He guessed he'd just call them kids until he got a clue about what their names were. Thank you, mummy, the kids said, hugging her. You're very welcome, she said. Now, Abigail and Avery, if you take your seats at the table, I'll have your pancakes ready in a minute. She turned to Steve. And honey, the coffee's ready if you'd like to get us some. Sure, Steve said. Though his hand, uh, he was repeating... Oh, uh, sorry. Though in his head, he was repeating, Abigail and Avery, Abigail and Avery. He didn't know where the coffee cups were, and he opened the wrong cabinet at first, but got it right on the second try. He poured them each a cup. Victoria said, Just a splash of milk in the mine, remember? He didn't remember, but he said, Of course, and got the milk out of the fridge. It was a happy breakfast. The pancakes themselves were terrific, and the bacon was crispy the way he liked it. But the best part was sitting around the table as a family, the kids talking and laughing, he and Victoria sharing private smiles. This was what he had always wanted. Did it matter that he hadn't remembered how he had gotten it? Maybe it didn't. People were always saying to live in the moment, and that's what Steve was doing. You couldn't get hung up on your past if you couldn't remember it. So, are you still planning on fixing the leaky faucet in the bathroom today? Victoria asked. Steve didn't remember that this was the plan. But he had learned about his about plumbing from his dad, so he was happy to comply. I'll certainly give it a shot, he said. A few minutes later, when Steve came back into the living room after fixing the faucet, Victoria was sitting on the couch in the living room, looking distressed. We need to talk, she said. Memory problems aside, Steve still knew that that particular sentence never meant good news. Okay, he said, sitting down beside her. She picked up an envelope from the coffee table. This was in the mail today. She handed it to him. He took out the letter and read the words, Notice of foreclosure. Wait, what? Is our house being foreclosed on? Apparently so, Victoria said. We've been underwater financially for a while. I really wanted to stay at home with the kids until they started kindergarten, but if I have to, I guess I'll go back to work. Let's not be hasty, Steve said. He knew he was going to feel like an idiot saying what he was going to say next, but he had to ask the question, Do I have a job? Sure, Victoria said. You work at the gas up. Oh, he said. He guessed he hadn't forgotten how to clean toilets. But even with you working overtime, the pay there doesn't keep up with the cost of living, especially since the kids came along, Victoria said. Well, I'm just going to have to find a better paying job then. Victoria gave him a brave smile. It would be wonderful if you could. Here comes the tickle monster! Steve stretched out his arms and wiggled his fingers. Abigail and Avery ran through the living room giggling. Chase me, Daddy! Chase me! Oh, God. I said that so loud in my house. And that is so sus. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, he couldn't get over the small burst of happiness he felt every time one of the kids called him Daddy. He heard it before he saw it. That was how it was with their long gravel driveway. If someone was approaching, you always heard the sound of the wheels on the gravel a few seconds before you saw the car. He saw, looking out the window, that in this case, the car was shiny, black and expensive looking. Unless he had forgotten, which was extremely likely given his memory problems, they weren't expecting anyone. He wondered who if 
sorry, he wondered if it might be someone who wanted to talk to him about the foreclosure, who might want him to sign some papers making him thus, making the loss of his family's home official. Steve braced himself for the worst. Kids, he said, you should go get washed up. Dinner's soon. Your mum's making spaghetti and meatballs. Pespeket Oh my god. I can't say spaghetti wrong. Peschetti and meatballs. Uh, Abigail sang. That wasn't really singing, but... Peschetti and meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail sang, taking her brother by the hand. I like meatballs, Avery said. They hurried off to wash their hands, leaving Steve to meet his fate. Steve stepped out onto the porch. His black car came to a stop. A moment later, a man stepped out of it. It was strange. Steve had forgotten so much, and yet he still remembered this much. The styled hair, the perfect suit. Steve even remembered exactly what it had said on his fancy business card. Brock Edwards, talent acquisition, Fazbear Entertainment. The man smiled as he approached. His teeth were dazzling. Mr Snodgrass, he said. We've met before. Brock Edwards, Fazbear Entertainment, Steve said, holding out his hand to shake. You have a good memory. Mr. Edwards said, taking Steve's offered hand. For some things, Steve said. Would you like to sit on the porch? We could go inside, but I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so I can't guarantee much quiet. The porch is perfect, Mr. Edwards said. Once they were settled in the porch's two rocking chairs, Steve asked, Can I get you anything to drink? Iced tea? Lemonade? No, thank you, Mr. Edwards said. Steve, since your memory is so good... I'm sure you remember the offer I made you the last time we met. Strangely, Steve could remember every detail. The horror games based on the myths surrounding Fazbear Entertainment. Now facing foreclosure, the idea of the games didn't seem quite so objectionable. I do, he said. Mr. Edwards nodded. Well, here at Fazbear Entertainment... Uh, sorry. Well, we here at Fazbear Entertainment want to know that the offer still stands. Can I stay here with my family to work on them? He remembered that last time the offer had involved relocating to an undisclosed area. Yes, Mr. Edwards said. We want you to work wherever and however you're most comfortable. Steve's face broke out in a grin. Their house was saved. He didn't hesitate. I'll take it, he said. <laughs> that night in bed, Victoria laid her head on his shoulder. I can't believe you saved us. He said. Fazbear Entertainment saved us, Steve said, though he had to admit her words made him feel good. Well, if you didn't have the talent and skills that Fazbear Entertainment wanted, then we wouldn't have been saved. Therefore, you saved us. She planted a kiss on his cheek. You're my hero. Ah, oh, shucks, Steve said, but he had to admit he did feel pleased with himself. They held each other close, and Steve fell into a deep sleep. It was coming from the living room. A stomping, rumbling sound. A robber? The house was so far out in the country, Steve was shocked that someone could find it to rob. He got out of bed and put his phone in the pocket of his robe, prepared to call the police. But wait. When he had last used... When had he last used his phone? All he could remember was that the last time he tried, it hadn't worked at all. He was going to have to take matters into his own hands. He was scared but he had to protect his family. Family? Family. He grabbed the softball bat that was in the closet and marched to the living room as though confident instead of terrified. Abigail was standing in front of the coffee table and bumping into it repeatedly. Her eyes were blank and staring, seemingly at nothing. Sweetie, are you okay? Steve asked, trying not to sound panicked. She turned to face him and smiled. Oh, hi daddy. Sweetheart, it's the middle of the night. You should go back to bed. Okay, Daddy. She shuffled down the hall and disappeared into her room. The door to Avery's room was slightly ajar, which was the natural state of all of the interior doors in the house. For some reason, none of them would fully close, let alone lock. Just to make sure his son was okay, Steve peeked into his room. Avery was asleep, safe and sound, sprawled out with one foot dangling over the side of the bed like always. Steve was relieved. There had been no intruder, but he was also worried and confused. He propped the softball bat up against the wall and climbed back into the bed. What are you doing? 
In his anxious state, his wife's voice made him nearly jump out of his skin. He, do he took a deep breath, tried to calm down. Didn't you hear the noise in the living room? No, I didn't hear anything, Victoria said. And you know what a light sleeper I am. If there had been noise, I definitely would have heard it. Maybe you were dreaming. No, it was real. When I went into the living room, Abigail was standing there. She looked blank and weird and was bumping into the furniture. Victoria gave him a patient smile. Sweetheart, do you remember that the children sleepwalk sometimes? They get it from you. You'll be dreaming wild stuff, saying absurd things and wandering all over the house. I even caught you wandering around in the yard one night. With you, it's sleepwalking the, with night terrors. Fortunately, the kids just seemed to have gotten the sleepwalking part. No, Steve said. I don't remember any of that. It was so upsetting to not be able to piece his recent past together. To not even remember basic facts about himself and his kids. Well, now you know, so there's no need to worry. Victoria smiled and patted the empty spot beside her. Come back to bed. Steve couldn't sleep. He always had that same sensation of someone or something inside the house wishing to do him and his family harm. And always Victoria comforted him, reminding him about his history of sleepwalking and night terrors. Often Steve marvelled at what an amazing wife she was, always so kind and patient and caring. He figured it couldn't be easy to be married to someone like him who was such a mess all the time. Mess or not, he was really pouring himself into making the first Fazbear Entertainment game. Since the company agreed to let Steve work at home, he had turned the house's tiny attic into his office. He called his da daily climbing off the ladder, his commute to work. It was nice to hear Victoria and the children talking and playing beneath him when he was working and to know that at lunchtime all he had to do was climb down the ladder to join them. He was still haunted by the nighttime visions and fears, but during the day, he channeled all those feelings into the game he was creating. Those feelings of being unsafe all ended up on the screen in front of him. If Fazbear Entertainment wanted a scary game, then a scary game was what they were going to have. When Steve climbed down the ladder for lunch, Abigail said, Surprise, Daddy! We're having a picnic! A voice on the radio that Victoria kept on during the day said, Heavy thunder showers expected over the next 24 hours. Take shelter if possible, folks. Lightning is dangerous. It doesn't sound like picnic weather, Steve said. Victoria, who was carrying a pitcher of lemonade, laughed. I thought we'd have a picnic indoors, like our first date. The picnic was nice. Victoria spread a blanket on the floor, and they ate chicken salad sandwiches and grapes and drank lemonade. After they ate, Abigail said, Daddy, let's play hide and seek. Hide. Seek. Avery yelled. Steve knew if he played with them a while, he might tire them out so they would take a nap and give their mum a break. Sure, he said. I can play a few rounds before I have to get back to work. The kids jumped up and down in a frenzy of delight. Steve felt his heart fill with love. They were such adorable, amazing kids. He wished he could remember every minute he had spent with them. Steve covered his eyes and started counting out loud very slowly. One, two, three. When he reached 20, he opened his eyes and began his search. Abigail was old enough to be a pretty good hider, but Avery could always be found in plain sight. Right now he was standing behind a floor lamp. Steve, like always, looked around as though he couldn't see his son, then finally moved closer to the lamp. Where's Avery? Where's Avery? Steve asked loudly and theatrically. He called to Victoria. Sweetheart, have you seen Avery? No, honey, I have no idea where she could be. She called back. Victoria knew her part of the game as well. I sure do wish I could find him, Steve said. Behind the floor lamp, Avery giggled. Steve kept up the ruse of not being able to find Avery until Avery's giggling grew more and more out of control. He finally jumped up and said, Daddy, I'm here! Steve put his hand on his chest and jumped backward as if startled. There you are, you got me, you're such a good hider. I got you, Avery said, still overcome with hilar hilarity. Now I just need to find your sister, Steve said. 
He wandered around the house and didn't hear and didn't see her anywhere. He felt a prickle of anxiety. He knew she was nearby and safe and just playing, but something about her invisibility triggered a primal parental fear. He thought of parents whose children would go missing for real, who spend months or years trying to find them. He thought of missing persons reports and kids' faces on, on milk cartons. He suddenly wanted to find a Abigail very badly, to see her beautiful little face. The bedroom closet. She had hidden there before. He went into the bedroom but hesitated before opening the closet door. Something inside him didn't want to open it, maybe because it made him think of his night terrors, of the sounds in the house that he investigated with a feeling of dread, not wanting to know what was, what was causing them, but needing to know. Boo! The closet door swung open and Abigail jumped out. Steve cried out for real and jumped backward. His heart pounded in his chest. This is reminding me, I, I'm not going to say too much, but this is reminding me a little bit of kind of FNAF 4. You know, Foxy in the closet, jump scare. Yeah, anyway, wow, you really got me, he said once he had recovered enough to talk. Silly daddy, it was just me, Abigail said. Did you think it was a ghost? Yeah, I kind of did, Steve said. You're right, daddy is very, very silly. Even in the daylight, even when playing with his kids, the fear was creeping in. He was afraid of noises, sudden movements even of his own little girl jumping out at him. He went back inside, climbed the ladder, and started back in on the game. It was easy for Steve to create jump scares because he'd just been on the receiving end of one himself. He knew the startled feeling, the cry of shock, the accelerated heartbeat, and then that wash of relief when you realise that it's just a game and you're really safe. Well, he knew all those things except for the relief. Lately, he never felt like he was safe.